um, talk um, some more about quantum inspired algorithms. Um, and I'm going to show how you can um, perform polynomials of matrices in time, um, independence of the input dimension. If you are given um, your input in this like quantum inspired access model um, that I covered last time. And just to recap what this model was, um, we had this uh, quantum, or this, we had this data structure that I defined that we said, okay, if this was in some quantum RAM, then you could get efficient state preparation of um, whatever entries you're storing in your data structure. And then we noticed that if you could access it classically, um, in order to devise like a classical algorithm that um, tries to match the runtime, um, then you could get this access that's called uh, sampling inquiry access. And um, based on this, we define this notion of oversampling inquiry access, which is basically that um, uh, we have oversampling inquiry access to a vector if we can answer these particular queries. This is a VI. Um, if we can, if you give me an index and I can give you an entry. And also I have sampling inquiry access to V tilde, where um, this means that I can uh, query for entries uh, V tilde I. I can also perform uh, measurements of V tilde as a state. And I can also learn the norm of V tilde. Um, right, so, and this V tilde is gonna have the property that it's like a reasonably uh, small upper bound, a reasonably, reasonably good tight upper bound on um, my entries of V. So all of my entries of V tilde are going to upper bound my entries of V. And then, you know, the whole magnitude, the whole, the whole mass is going to be um, just five times the mass of the original vector. And with this, we, sh we saw that you could um, get similar extensibility properties of this sampling inquiry access that you could with the block encoding. So with sampling inquiry access to U and V, we can get access to some linear combination. And then the amount of overhead here is essentially um, is um, some the number of things in your linear combination times sort of the sums of the L2 masses. So you might compare this to the block encoding setting where you get block encodings of U and V, and then you can get a block encoding of alpha U plus alpha V, or alpha U plus beta V. And then you divide this by alpha plus beta. So here implicitly what's happening is like, this is like an alpha norm of U plus beta norm of V. So this is sort of like, um, you can see how these are sort of similar, maybe they're off by some um, factor in terms of the number of elements in your um, linear combination. But um, there's some resemblance there. And what I'm going to uh, show today is that you can get this statement about um, sampling and query access being closed or undertaking products. So if you have sampling and query access to A and sampling and query access to B, then you can get sampling and query access to something that's like approximately A, B, A, or I think A dagger B. Okay. And, okay, to do this, I will, it'll be useful to define the corresponding notions for matrices. Um, so, Okay, if you recall, like our sampling inquiry access to a matrix was sampling inquiry access to the rows of A along with sampling inquiry access to the row norms. Um, um, yes. Yes, there is a reason why you need the dagger. Um, there's some nuances in comparison if you are considering these like, like for example, if, you, if I, I could give you both sampling query access to A dagger and A and then B dagger and B and then be done with it. Um, um, there's some subtle, nu there's, a, there's some like subtleties because um, typically if you wanted to actually like compare this to a quantum algorithm, you're only going to store one of these guys in a data structure. 
Um, but in some sense, like, you're going to get a block encoding of A, and then the inverse is going to be a block encoding of A dagger just immediately. Um, and so... Um, so something like that does work. <laughs> so, so, what I, so what you said just now would incur some error that's like scaling with the Frobenius norm of B. So that would be an issue. Uh, but there is a way to make this work. It's just, it is way more, um, it's like more complicated. Yeah. Okay. But basically you can get like an approximate singular value decomposition. Um, and then you can like take V, or yeah, you can just invert it in this way. <clears throat> um, right. Um, but yeah, this has like bad, like this is a very slow, I think the, the best way we know how to do it is very slow. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, good question. Um, so, Right, so I, I was defining the sampling query access to A, and it's just sampling query access to the rows and the vector of row norms. Similarly, you can define sampling query access to um, um, oversampling and query access. And what this is, is it's just, you have query access to A, and then you have sampling query access to some A tilde, where it satisfies these same properties. So um, here you have, you know, Basically, here you just replace like um, so a tilde i j is an upper bound on a i j, and then the Frobenius norms are um, is your quantity is your mass. Um, okay, and so with this, you can say things like. Um, that given sampling query access to U and um, sampling query access to V, you can get sampling query access um, to U V dagger, their outer product. Um, and the way that you do this is just saying like, what I need to do is I need to compute entries, but I can do this from computing entries of U and entries of V. Um, I can compute um, norms by computing norms of from V and then norms from U or like entries from, from the two. And then I can sample just by saying, okay, if I, a row of U V dagger is a rescaled row of V dagger or a rescaled uh, version of V. And so I can use samples from V here. And the row norms are, um, the vector of row norms is a rescaled version of U. So I can sample from U to get these like uh, row norm samples. So this is something that was in the problem set um, yesterday. Um, and similarly, we can extend this notion of um, we can extend um, our linear combinations argument here as well. Um, And uh, the value of phi is what you would expect it to be um, here. Um, I'm just going to write it for completeness. Um, but basically, um, it follows from the same um, same protocol. And Okay, so this will be all the statements that I'll need for later. Um, and now we're going to talk about how you actually get this, um, how you actually get this uh, product. And you'll see that it's like an approximate statement. So we're going to use some approximation. Um, uh, we're going to need to use uh, some other tools other than the one I've just been describing. And what that is is, um, this idea of sketching. And the, if you haven't seen it before, the idea of um, sketching matrices 
is that suppose I have some matrix A, and it's like M by N, and then M and N are too big, and I can't um, compute anything on this. Um, <coughs> Then, um, imag like, so imagine I want to compute, like, um, you know, the top, top uh, I want to compute the spectral norm or something. Um, but this is too large. So you can imagine um, I can multiply it, left and right multiply it by some vectors, some sketch vectors, or sorry, sorry some sketch matrices. And then bring this down to something that's uh, much smaller, um, something S by T. And then, my hope is that the properties of A will be inherited by this sketch, sorry, which I'm calling SAT, um, and for a particular nice choice of S and T. So one case of this is like Johnson, Linden, Strauss, um, uh, where these S and T's can be like Gaussian. And for us, these will be sampling matrices. Um, so, um, so if we have some distribution we're going to define a corresponding sampling matrix, um, um, which uh, <clears throat> we're going to uh, get by taking each row to be some, um, selecting some row independently at random. Um, and how this works is that, um, so we're going to call this a, um, uh, we're going to say this is sampled from P. If we have that, okay, um, the rows of I are independent, uh, chosen independently at random, and then this row in particular is going to be some, um, some computational basis vector, and that's going to be rescaled by the probability, by the root of the probability. And then this will be the value of this row with probability um, pk. And so what your S matrix is going to look like is it's going to look like, OK, say it's like here, this is 1 over root sp1. And then here, it might be 1 over root sp, I don't know, 5. Um, so it might look something like this, and all of these other entries are zero. And um, furthermore, what's happening if we apply it to a matrix A is that um, if you look at what's happening, we're selecting um, rows. Yes. So this guy, this row will be A1 over square root of S, P1, and then the other rows will also be the corresponding rows of, of A. So this is just what's happening when we choose our, our, our S. And the thing to note is that um, if we have a uh, sampling query access um, to A, um, then we can uh, form some uh, sketch S efficiently. <coughs> um, and then what we do is we sample it from um, little a, which is our vector of row norms. So in particular, like um, our P, our probabilities are going to be um, the row norms rescaled by the Frobenius norm, row norm squared. <clears throat> okay, and you can sort of see how to do this. So this will take um, this will take O of S queries. Um, you can sort of see how to do this, right? Because um, we just need to uh, pull all of these samples from A, which we have because of our access model. And then we need to compute these probabilities themselves, and we can do these with queries to our um, with um, queries to our a. We might need to query the norms of a. And then um, in total, we can just describe this s as like a list of the non-zero entries here. So we can just describe all of these, and then um, we can. This is our description of s. 
<clears throat> um, and, okay. Secondly, the thing that I want to observe is that um, if we um, have our A and then S sampled as above, um, so in this setting, when we have this essay, um, we can also sample again to get SAT. Um, and how we can say this, how we can show this, is that we say that we have sampling query access to both SA and uh, its uh, conjugate transpose. And then the overhead will be O of 1 and O of S. And so um, if we can have this, then we can uh, go from sampling query access to A, and then we can construct S and T um, such, so we can sample S from A and then uh, T from SA dagger. And then we can get some sketch SAT with probability, um, or sorry, in time ST, or in ST queries, I guess. Um, okay. And if you wanted to try to prove this, um, I won't go through the whole thing, but the main thing you might, the main thing that would give you trouble is the prospect of trying to sample from the column norms of SA. Everything else is like you can uh, do it in a sort of obvious way. Like, uh, for example, all of the rows of SA are um, all of the rows of SA are norm are rows of A, so you can sample from them as normal, and all of your uh, row norms of SA. If you look at what the values are, all the row norms are actually equal. So all the all the row norms are equal to the Frobenius norm, um, rescaled by S, and so you can. Hello, hello. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, sam when I say sampling from A, I just mean sampling from the row norms of A, yeah. Um, okay, you, you, can, you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, okay, so um, as I said before, all of the row norms of SA are the same, and so you can sample from the row norms by sampling an entry, like sampling in a row uniformly at random. How you sample from the column norms, okay, here what I want to do is I want to sample um, J with probability, I guess the row, or I guess the column of J. over the Frobenius norm. And there's a little, there's a trick to doing this, which is that um, we have access to SA. So what we can do is we can sample, um, so this is what we want. And what we can do is we can sample I with probability proportional to the rows. Um, And then we can sample some J with respect to that row that we sample from. Um,
OK. And if we do this procedure where we sample a row and then sample the cor from the corresponding row, then this will give us a, an index ij, and the probability of this ij will be um, proportional to um, the entry squared. So it's like we're sampling from SA when written out as a vector. And then if we discard our i, then we're sampling j with probability proportional to the sum over i of these, uh, of these entries. OK, and this is precisely the thing that we wanted here. Um, so we're sampling an entry and then ignoring the row. And this will give us the right thing. OK. Um, Right, so I've, I've now argued that you can efficiently create these sketches, uh, but it's, I haven't yet t told you what approximation properties this will have, like what the point of this, this all is. Um, and I guess I'll demonstrate by saying, okay, consider we have some S, and I'm going to consider a one by M matrix. So here we're just thinking about this as like a single row I guess it's uh, selecting a single row of my matrix. And then if I look what this value is, is it's, um, what this is, is it's um, some row AI um, over square root of S PI with probability PI. And so what I can note is that if I have some matrix product, um, sorry, if I have some um, matrix product and I look at um, the sketch version of this product where I add a sketch in between, okay? So there's, uh, if I put like two sketching matrices in between A and B, then what this is, is it's um, the outer product, the, the row of A times the row of uh, B. I guess there's a dagger on one of these. So it's an outer product. And then over S times PI, but here S is one, so I guess we can ignore this. Okay. Over PI with probability PI. Okay. And um, the thing to observe is that um, in expectation, this is the sum of the um, the sum of these outer products, and this is going to be equal to a dagger b. So when we sketch things down, we can create an unbiased estimator of uh, products of two matrices. And so far, I haven't used any properties of my of my probabilities probabilities. Um, but what you can s observe is that if we were sampling this PI, um, let's say PI was sampled 50-50 from um, the row norms of A and the row norms of B. So what I mean by this is that PI, if we take PI to be equal to one half of, okay, we, we flip a coin and then based on that coin, we either sample from A, the row norms of A, or the row norms of B. Um, and by AMGM, this is going to be at least um, the, the geometric mean of these two, which is um, this product here. Okay. Then what you can observe is that um, this imply, these two imply 
that uh, the norm of SA dagger SB is always uh, upper bounded by this uh, Frobenius norm product, right? Because here what's happening is that these two row norms are canceling out with the row norms here. So in, sen in some sense, all of the, all of my estimator is always going to be bounded. And this allows me to use um, concentration inequalities to show that uh, if you take a bunch of samples of this and then average them, it'll be an unbiased estimate. It'll be a, it'll converge um, quickly to um, A times B, A dagger times B. Okay. Um, okay, so the, I'm going to state some version of this that I, um, for concreteness, I guess. Um, and what that is, is um, if we have some, again, A and B, and then we have some S uh, 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 sample one half from A and then one half from B. Um, then if I take, um, so here this is a size S sketch. Then if I take S to be um, up to a log factor, it needs to be um, the um, um, I think this value. Then it then uh, it's true that. Um, my sketch approximates my um, my product up to operator norm, um, and here you can think about these factors as being um, some rank um, quantity of a and b. Um, okay, and. With this, I can show you why um, why we can get our extensibility property. Um, so, with this, uh, I'll just sketch it out. How you get this? <clears throat> so we have sample inquiry access to x and y. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to produce this sketch. And then with this sketch, we know that um, um, we know that this product is approximately our desired product to, um, to estimate. Um, and, okay, um, now if you think about what this product is, as I mentioned before, this is an average of, um, outer products of the rows. So this is, um, Right, an average of the outer products of the rows, or I guess a sum. And each of these are rescaled rows of X and Y respectively. So I have sample and query access to them. And so I have sample and query access to, um, so I have sample and query access to SX and SY which means I have sample and query access to these outer products. Um, okay. 
And finally, this means I have sample inquiry access to this whole expression because it's a linear combination. Um, a linear combination of <coughs> these outer products. So I have the sampling query access to the whole thing up to some oversampling constants. Okay. Um, and this is approximately x times y. Now, where, why do we need to sketch things down? It's because that when we are taking these linear combinations, the o overhead that we incur, I didn't write this down above, but um, when we do linear combinations, we incur some overhead that's the number of uh, summands um, in our linear combination. And so naively, oops, naively um, we're taking a linear combination here without the S, it would be a linear combination of some like large dimension thing. So we need it to be size s, where s is something here that's like independent of my input dimension, in order to, um, in order to then be able to um, uh, have this linear combination protocol be efficient. And um, it's in the lecture notes, and I, um, but eventually what you get is this, uh, is that you can get this value of phi to be um, the Frobenius norm of x squared times the Frobenius norm of y squared, um, which is sort of, I guess, what you, what one might expect um, from just combining the upper bounds. Okay. Um, right. So, are there any questions about this? Um, right, so, um, in a similar way, um, I have this in the, I have this in the lecture notes, um, also, but, um, we can, we can also use this to, um, I guess, dequantize this simple block encoding protocol I had before, which is that if I had um, a block encoding of A and then the state psi, then I could get a copy of the state A times psi. Um, with probability, um, Uh, proportional to <coughs> the norm of a times psi squared. Um, when we have this as given as input in a data structure, then this a is going to be rescaled by the Frobenius norm. And so this, you're going to see some Frobenius norm scaling appear in the um, probability. And so you can think about this as having a runtime of, um, I guess it's the Frobenius norm squared times the norm of psi squared, or over the over the norm of a psi squared. Um, and what um, I give a more thorough argument with, with like the parameters and stuff in the lecture notes. Um, but in the same setting, if I have sample and query access to A and sample and query access to psi, um, then what I can do is I can sort of approximate this by um, with a sketching matrix, as I mentioned before. And then using the same ideas as, as again, um, up here, this allows me to get sample and query access to um, this, <coughs> this sketched matrix, which is approximately A times psi. 
And so you can imagine, like, OK, if I want a sample from the output, then I could use this to get a sample from my output as well. And so I'm sort of matching what the quantum algorithm is doing. And if you look at the runtime of this algorithm, the runtime will be, in order to get a sample, um, it'll be basically a, a proportional to um, um, to get a sample is, let's see, um, yeah. So it's equal to Trevenius norm to the fourth times norm of psi. Um, So um, you can see that, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> you can see that this is the same, um, but it's, uh, there's this issue of, there's an additional factor that appears here. <coughs> so this is like a polynomial factor. Um. <coughs> Namely, this factor is smaller than this factor, so it's like you're only losing quadratically. <coughs> And then you might be wondering <coughs> that there's like, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> you might be wondering that there's like an epsilon here. Um, and there's no epsilon in this runtime and whether that's an issue. Um, <coughs> and the resolution to this is that for these like sampling questions, you can see these like uh, gaps of like log one over epsilon to epsilon. Um, I don't know of a formal argument that this is like inherent. Um, it might not be. Um, but if you wanted to use these samples to actually like construct some estimator, to like, um, for example, like learn some properties, is this true or false? Then this epsilon, one over epsilon will, will appear um, because you're trying to distinguish two states that are maybe epsilon far apart. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, now I'll move on to like general polynomials, but. Um, any questions about this? <coughs> okay, sweet. All right. <coughs> so now I've shown how to give these extensibility properties for both linear combinations of uh, of my input and also products. Um, and using this, I can sort of you can imagine me chaining all of these together to get sampling and query access to more complicated objects. Um, <coughs> and in the same way I mentioned before, where this is like sort of not, uh, it doesn't necessarily give you everything. Um, here, we also have to do some more trickery to get um, the ability to perform any polynomial on a matrix um, and, and do this efficiently. Um, um, so, in the rest of the time, I'll sketch how, uh, I'll give like a sketchy description of how you get a classical algorithm for the singular value transformation task. And what this task is, is that if we have sample and query access to A and sample and query access to B, <coughs> we want sample and query access to some, uh, I guess I'll say, call it Y. <coughs> Where Y is approximately P of A times B. <coughs> Um, and here we have P, which is bounded between minus one and one, and also the degree of P, <laughs> I'm using D for right now, sorry. Um, the degree of P is, is small. <coughs> and what we want is we want some runtime that's 
Um, we want a runtime that's polynomial in one over epsilon and D, and then um, the Frobenius norm over the spectral one here. So this is like our, our rank notion. Um, is that it? I think so. Oh, and also, yeah, we should use that. We should uh, normalize things. So the spectral norm of A is at most one. Or I guess uh, we can say, let's say it's equal to one, and so we can just drop this term and just say for Frobenius norm. <coughs> and so the idea is that uh, uh, quantumly, if you give me a block encoding of A and, a, and copies of my state B, then I can do this and it'll take time that's, uh, it'll take time, I think, D times Frobenius norm of A. Um, and uh, again, this epsilon doesn't appear, but if you wanted to do something, there would be a one over epsilon that appears. Okay, and I'll tell you, um, um, I'll tell you first the idea for monomials, and then I'll extend it to general polynomials. Okay, so consider some monomial. I'll just say, um, actually, I guess it's like, yeah, okay. Um, uh, what this is, is it's, um, this is a dagger cubed times B. And if we wanted to sketch this down, what we could do is we could say, um, we have these constructed uh, we can construct these S and T, and uh, these are our sketching matrices that we can sample efficiently. And they have this property that if you put them in between matrix matrices, they can approximate the products. Um, and specifically, uh, what happens is that um, uh, um, it approximates um, these uh, products of A times A well, uh, S approximates A times A well, and then T approximates S A times S A well. So, um, and this is because we sampled our T from S A. We sampled our T from the column norms of SA. And so it's going to approximate SA well. Um, and so with these approximation properties in hand, we can just say that this, this, uh, <coughs> this polynomial, this monomial, is you can approximate it by, OK, first of all, we can say that it's um, here. We can just approximate each one, each thing by its product. Okay, and here this SB, I didn't state this property, but you can show that it holds. Um, <coughs> if you have like a matrix times a vector and you're sampling, you can sketch down this matrix product as well. And then you can sketch it again to say that, okay, this is approximately SAT dagger, SAT. So I'm sketching this, this product here, and I'm sketching this product here. Um, to get, wait, no, no, I'm sketching this here, sorry. So, wait, what am, what I'm doing is I'm sketching this interior. Okay. Right, so I can approximate all the way down to this like fully sketched down matrix. And the thing to note is that this, these dimensions are now very small. So this SAT is S times T, this SAT dagger is T times S, and this is a S by one matrix. 
And so I can compute all of these in O of TS time. And what I'm left with is something that's like of the form SA dagger times V. Um, and what this is, is this is a, like all the columns of SA dagger are rows of A, right? SA is rows of A. And then this V is some small vector. So what this is, is I'm taking a linear combination of a small number of rows of A. And this is my solution. Um, and so this means that I have sample and query access to the output because it's a small linear combination of rows of A. And I have sample and query access to my input. <coughs> okay, so, so um, in this setting, it basically becomes a game of I take my input and I just hit it with as many sketches as I can until things are independent of dimension. And then when things are independent of dimension, here my S and T are going to be size, I don't know. Um, so I think S and T here need to be size Rubini theorem squared over epsilon squared. Okay. And for this choice, then I can, <coughs> then everything's small enough that I can just multiply everything through. And then there will be a final matrix on the outside that I can't sketch away. And this will uh, lift my small vector back into the space uh, of the, the, the space of my output. <coughs> okay, so this is the approach for a monomial. How I want to do general polynomials is I use Chebyshev polynomials. And um, specifically what I want to do is I want to be able to evaluate a polynomial um, by with operations that are like multiply and add. So, um, um, so if I have some polynomial, that's um, again it's like bounded and its degree degree um, is small. Um, then, as I discussed before, we can write P of X as this uh, linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials. And here, you can think of my AKs as all being relatively small. So, right, um, these AKs are bounded by two um, from something from the previous lecture. And um, the question is, how do I evaluate this P? Um, uh, you might think that you can evaluate P in the monomial basis by saying P of X is equal to um, A, sorry, maybe a different, C D X to the D plus C D minus one X to the D minus one and so on, right? Because I already showed how you can do these monomials and so you can think you can probably just chain them. Um, but the problem is that these C Ds can be ex exponentially large. And so <coughs> if we have some algorithm that incurs epsilon error in my approximation here, then when I multiply it by CD, it could be blown up by two to the D. And this will break our uh, dreams. Okay, so an alternative is we wanna use something, some recurrence or some um, description of my polynomial that is uh, going to be stable the entire time. It's never gonna blow up. And this is what this Clenshaw recurrence is. Um, so I'm going to write it one way, and then I'm going to write it a different way. Um, so the version that you'll most commonly see is um, this version where you start with uh, zeros, and then you can evaluate this polynomial by saying um, it's similar to the recurrence relation defining the Chebyshev polynomials themselves. Um, plus AK. And then, so the idea is that I start off with zeros and, I s and then I run this recurrence relation. Maybe I should do it for K. Yeah. 
And what this will do is it'll, uh, sorry, sorry. I start from QD plus one and then I uh, construct QD and then QD minus one all the way down to Q zero. And then what you can show is that P of X is equal to one half Q zero minus Q two. So, um, so we are evaluating these, uh, we can evaluate this and what we are doing is we're just taking this uh, recurrence. And then what you could show is that um, all of these QKs turn out to be bounded. <coughs> um, and so whenever you're taking your, S your approximations, you're never scaling it by too much. And so if you, uh, so you should think about like this being better in a way that um, should, might become more clear in a, in a second. Um, now, formally what we're going to do is we're going to do a slightly different thing for some, uh, for technical reasons, which is we're going to evaluate this recurrence here, which is um, just the version that works for, um, it's the version that works at, and uh, it maintains that all of your iterates are odd. So, um, now I'm going to restrict to the case that p is odd. And this means that all my even coefficients are zero. And what my iterate iteration is going to be is the following. Um, and then you, if you uh, do this all the way to um, zero, then your polynomial is going to be um, Q zero minus Q one. And okay, you're asking, what does this have anything to do with um, matrices? Well, um, this, all these scalar recurrences lift to the matrix setting naturally. Um, if I define some other recurrence and say that, um, if I define this recurrence, where I replace all of the X's with like A's. And I replace, um, I replace this here with, um, is this right? Yeah, okay. Um, I add this B here on this, uh, this thing that I'm adding to make it a vector. Then what I get is that, um, my final outcome will be equal to P of A times B. Okay. And, right, so if I wanted to compute this and I didn't care about the runtime, what I would do is I would just compute this every, uh, for all my iterations and then get my output and the output would, uh, it'll be, um, so if, if we're imagining A is M by N, then this will take um, O of D times M N time, or M N can be like the number of non-zero entries of, of A, if you want. Um, okay, so this is going to be our recurrence. And the idea will be the same as before which is that we have some approximation properties of our sketch, and then we can use this. And so, okay, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll um, do some slightly bad form and I'll edit the equation um, itself. Um, but what we can do is we can say um, that we maintain uh, instead of maintaining QK, which is something that's large, we can maintain it as a linear combination of small, uh, a small number of rows of A. So by this I mean um, we can maintain instead of, oops, sorry. This is U. Instead of maintaining these U's, what we can maintain is um, some V where V is small. 
Okay, and then what our recurrence will be is equal to um, <coughs> um, okay. A times VK minus Um, okay. And then what we can do is we can, um, <coughs> oh, that's not going to work. And then what we can do is we can start hitting things with uh, sketches. So this will be approximately um, SA dagger SA minus. Um, Oh, actually, what I'm going to do, okay, specifically, what I'm going to maintain is um, this. So this will this will actually enforce that my linear combination is small because it's going to just be the linear combinations of the s things in my sketch. Um, okay. Sorry. Um, Okay, so then what we're going to have is um, um, and so on. Oh, actually, I want to also approximate this final thing too. And with this, I can pull every pull out this um, essay here. Um, okay, I think I'm almost out. Of, I think I'm out of time. So I'll just say here that you get some expression in here, and this expression is going to be some vector, comp some matrix vector computation, and it's dimension s by one. So we've already shrunk down our dimension. And by doing some, uh, like one more sketch in here, we can get something that we can compute efficiently. And then when we compute this efficiently, what we sacrifice is that, okay, we're uh, able to compute this in um, time independent of dimension, but we're incurring some epsilon factor. And then you can use an argument about the scalars, uh, how the scalar errors propagate to show that the matrix errors also do not, do not um, blow up too badly. And so this will give you an algorithm that um, has this desired property, has this desired runtime. Um, okay, that's it, thanks. <laughs>